I have mixed in some slides, video, and inside stories in this program that are unrelated to the topics of teamwork and leadership. They'll answer some very popular space questions. So we're going to have some fun as we go through the program. It won't all be a serious message. But I'm going to do my best here in the next few minutes to bring you along vicariously on a space shuttle launch. So I want everybody to suspend this belief, to pretend that we're all fellow crew members. It's T minus three hours before liftoff. We're walking from the crew quarters. We climb into the crew van, drive to the launch pad, take the elevator to the cockpit level, exit that, walk across the access arm. We enter the white room where we're dressed in our harnesses. Then we get out on our hands and knees, <clears throat> excuse me, and crawl into the cockpit. There'll be technicians inside to help lay us back into our chairs. They will strap us to those chairs. And then as they leave, they will close the side hatch the access arm will be retracted and we will be left alone. T minus 15 seconds and our hearts are pounding and deep adrenal surges. T minus 10 seconds, go for main engine start. Atlantis has checked a thousand items, pressures, temperatures, voltages, valve positions, and now she's screaming, yes, yes, I'm ready, I can fly. T minus nine, eight, seven, six, main engine start. We hear nothing of the remaining count. The cockpit is violently wrenched as Atlantis' three liquid engines explode to life. The instruments blur with the vibrations. The commander reaches forward and seizes the instrument panel glare shield trying to steady himself. Then the solid rocket boosters ignite. We're slapped into our seats from the force of nearly two gravities as Atlantis leaps from the Earth. If we could look back and down, we can't, but if we could, we would see a scene very similar to this. This is a view of an unmanned rocket launching, but it looks similar with a space shuttle with the rocket motor igniting, the rocket zooming away from the launch pad, and the launch complex receding in the background. It's thank God we don't have this perspective on a space shuttle. It scares us more than we already are. Uh, back in the cockpit of a shuttle looking straight up, and that's your perspective here, any clouds above us will race into our faces, disappear behind us. The sky will blacken very quickly. Within two minutes, the sky will be pitch black. Uh, at two minutes and 12 seconds, we'll hear this loud bang see the fire across the windows as these boosters are explosively separated, and then it gets dead quiet. For the next six and a half minutes, we'll continue into space on the three liquid-fueled engines, burning liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and that big orange gas tank. But from here on up, it's very smooth, very quiet. The only way you can tell you're moving besides looking at your instruments are the G-forces slowly building on your body, and those will ultimately stabilize at three times the force of gravity. That is not like the science fiction movies where you see people's faces being peeled back off their skull like that. It's not like that, but it does feel as if somebody's sitting on you. It's a little hard to breathe and hard to talk at three Gs. And this entire process that I just described to you, from liftoff, zero altitude, zero speed, to being in an orbit around 200 miles above the Earth at a speed approaching five miles per second, that entire process takes just 10 minutes. It's a very short, violent, and frankly, terrifying 10 minutes. Now, I wanted to share that narrator with you to give you an appreciation of what it's like to be tied into the cockpit of one of these things and be bl blasted into space. And with that appreciation, I ask you this question. If we had not been pretending that this had been for real, if all of you truly had been tied to four million pounds of propellant, what type of a team would you want out there holding your life in their palm? Well, I had numerous opportunities to ponder that question, and the answer I came to is I think the identical answer you would come to in the identical circumstance. When your life is on the line, you're going to want a team that's the best holding it in their palm. And how do teams get to be the best? They get there by practicing fundamentals, by doing little things consistently and religiously day in and day out until they become as natural as breathing. You don't even think about them. When my life is on the line, when I'm involved with any team, I want everybody on that team understanding the dangers of a normalization of deviance. I'll define that here in just a moment. I want everybody understanding the essence of responsibility as it applies to the individual as well as it applies to the team leaders. And I want a team that's filled with courageous self-leaders. Uh, in the end, folks, it's how well we lead ourselves. It certainly determines how far we go personally and certainly how far we go professionally and how far we take our teams. Uh, it's how well we lead ourselves. I don't think enough is discussed about self-leadership, so I want to talk about that as a, one of the teamwork fundamentals. Uh, I'm going to use experiences I had both as an Air Force flyer and as a NASA astronaut to develop points on these, on these fundamentals. Okay, that mechanically reviews for you what was going on with Challenger. Let's now talk about these fundamentals and let's begin with the discussion of normalization of deviance. What is this? 
Well, it's that natural human tendency, particularly in pressure situations, to want to take a shortcut, to accept a lower standard of performance. Uh, maybe it's a lower standard of personal performance. Maybe it's a lower standard of uh, performance for some machine you oversee, or lower standard of performance for a team you lead. What kind of pressure are we talking about? Personal pressure. Maybe there's some, something going on with the family. Maybe it's budget pressure, schedule pressure. But you're in a situation, you have standards that are expected of you. You've been trained to meet those standards. You have everything in place to meet those standards, but you rationalize, I can't do this job and meet these standards because of this pressure I'm under. I'm going to have to take a shortcut. Oh, I'm only going to do it this one time. Next time I'll do it the way I know I'm supposed to do it. Okay, so you take that shortcut, you accept that lower standard of performance, and guess what? Nothing bad happens. You get away with it. What's liable to happen the very next time you're in these same circumstances? Because nothing bad happened the last time, you're going to be mightily tempted to do the same thing again. And if you do it enough times, you start making that shortcut enough times, and after a while, you lose sight of this deviance that you've accepted. Here's the standards that you're supposed to be meeting. And here's where you are. This deviance has been normalized into your behavior. You no longer see it. And what happens with normalization of deviance, folks, is it leads to predictable surprises. And almost always, those predictable surprises are very injurious to the team. And in hazardous environments, they can be deadly to the team. And if you ever want an object lesson on a predictable surprise, what normalization of deviance can do, look at Challenger. Challenger was no accident. Challenger was a predictable surprise. At the time that rocket came apart, killing those seven astronauts, scattered throughout NASA and their contractors, in filing cabinets and desk drawers, were written documents, memos, predicting that the exact thing that did happen, i.e. failure of that O-ring, was going to happen. And where did people get the information to make such predictions? From the best source available, flight data. It doesn't get any better than to get the piece back and see how it performed. And that's the case with these solid rocket boosters. They're not throwaway items. 25 miles up, they burn out. They're jettisoned. They fall away. They have these gigantic parachutes that are deployed. Even though the casings weigh 130,000 pounds empty, air is trapped inside these things when they hit the water, so they float. Tugboats are positioned out there to put a line on them, tow them back to shore, where they're cleaned up, taken apart, inspected, and used over again. The operative word in this process is inspected. And on 14 of 24 flights before Challenger, Challenger was number 25. On 14 of 24 flights before Challenger, in the inspection process, quality assurance and safety people noted that the O-rings, which were never designed to be touched by fire, were being touched by fire. And they understood the ramifications of their findings. This design is flawed, it's going to fail, and people are going to die. And they basically put words that effect in these various memos. I want to share with you excerpts of two of these memos, both of which were written by Thaikal engineers, the contractor, to their customer, NASA. The first memo is dated February of 1984. This is two years before Challenger. And in part, the memo reads, The recent experience of two burned O-rings on STS-11, that's the 11th shuttle mission, raises concerns with STS-13. When I read this, I wonder how come nobody was concerned about STS-12, my first mission. But apparently they, <laughs> apparently they weren't. <coughs> Excuse me. The O-ring leak check procedure is also an urgent concern. Your support in this urgent matter is requested. Two years before Challenger, the label urgent has been hung on this O-ring design. It's not working. Here's a sentence from a Thaikal memo dated July of 85. This is six months before Challenger. The memo was written by Mr. Roger Bougelet, a Thaikal rocket engineer. In his memo, he wrote a very prophetic sentence. Here it is. It is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem with the field joint, and that's the O-ring, having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight, a crew, and all the launch pad facilities. Mr. Bougelet's prediction was only off 73 seconds. He thought the rocket was going to blow up in the launch pad, destroy the vehicle, kill the crew, and take out the launch pad facilities. He missed it by 73 seconds. Challenger was no accident, folks. Challenger was a predictable surprise. Now, I know what everybody's thinking right now. Why didn't the team react to these warnings, ground the fleet, and fix the problem? And the answer is, to a significant degree, the team that was working this problem was laboring under a long-term normalization of decline.